One of the hottest topics in neuroscience today is the study of impulsiveness, the sometimes disastrous urge, especially among teenagers, to act before thinking. So that impulsivity is something you went through yourself. Mm, as a teenager, absolutely. How, how did that feel? It felt as though there was only the thing in front of me, the reward in front of me. Yeah. The, the future was like a, a haze or a mist. Actions didn't have consequences because they happened so far into this mysterious future that they didn't even matter. There were people that I used to hang out with who have not had a, simi a similar uh, a fate that I have. There are people who were impulsive just like me, but they didn't have their prefrontal cortex kick in around 23 or 24 like I did. And mm. those people are in trouble right now. And so understanding why we develop differently in that way, understanding the sources of individual differences in brain development that, that lead us to these different trajectories, that's something that's really near and dear to my own heart. To explore how the brain weighs the future against the present, Josh Buckholt is asking volunteers in a scanner at Harvard to decide between a reward they can get soon or a larger reward they can get if they're willing to wait. Why doesn't she just make a decision before she even goes in there that she's going to delay all her rewards and pile up the money? The way that we value rewards isn't rational. So the way that, that we, you know, the, the pleasure that we get out of receiving a reward decays in proportion to the time that it takes to get that reward. So if I give you $20 now, you'll be very happy. Mm -hmm. and if I say that you can have $20 in two weeks, you'll be happy, but not quite as happy. Right, but if I, and, and if, if you say $20 now, or $21 in two weeks. Right. It's not, not worth waiting two weeks for an extra dollar. Right, exactly. And it's the rational thing to do, but people don't always behave rationally. Yeah. And this sort of deviation from rationality has to do with the way that our brain values these immediate rewards. And so that's what we're looking for in Fenna's brain. The region Josh is studying is one of several places in the brain that gets activated by the neurotransmitter dopamine. It's a structure called the ventral striatum. We know that that region is incredibly important for motivating an individual or an organism to obtain a reward. Uh -huh. right? So when you lesion that area in yeah. animals and prevent dopamine from being released there, yeah. they will not engage in motivated, effortful behavior to uh -huh. obtain rewards. Uh -huh. So even though we think about dopamine as being kind of like a pleasure neurotransmitter, it's really most important for driving behavior, motivating and energizing an organism's behavior so that it makes sure that it does whatever it has to do to get that reward. Yeah. And do you like ice cream? Yeah. Yeah, what kind of ice cream? Uh, vanilla. Vanilla ice cream. So imagine that you want some vanilla ice cream. Yeah. So you get an idea in your mind, I'm going to have some vanilla ice cream. Yeah. You get into your car, you drive to the store. All the way during that drive, you're energized to get that vanilla ice cream. Mm -hmm. And that has a sort of reward value to it. You're driven to go get that Even ice cream. Even while I'm driving. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, you, it's raining out and, and you're driving there and you have to endure all of these obstacles to get mm -hmm. there. But you have this drive to get that vanilla ice cream. You go to your store, you purchase the vanilla ice cream, you drive it home, you, you finally get to eat that vanilla ice cream. Now the pleasure, the hedonic response that you get from eating that vanilla ice cream is separate from the drive, the incentive uh, drive. Uh. In the scanner, subjects differ in how willing they are to put up with waiting for that larger payoff to delay gratification. Is it more difficult for teenagers to delay gratification? Absolutely. We get better and better at doing this thing over time, the older we get. So it seems that adolescents are going through this test that you're giving right now where they're, they're having to decide between this rush of, of feeling to get a reward right now or to hold off um, and think about the cost of it for later. Well, we all are. Right? As we go through life, we're always having to make these decisions where we trade the value of the immediate reward against the long-term consequences of engaging in that rewarding behavior. And so, you know, life in general is, is a constant test of delayed gratification. It's a constant test of self-control. And that's why these measures of self-control are so incredibly predictive of adaptive functioning in, in, in all different areas of human life. Right? These measures of self-control are predictive of academic success, mm -hmm. they're predictive of occupational success, they're predictive of who's likely to get in trouble with the law and who's likely to become addicted to drugs. Right? Mm -hmm. In many ways we can think of these self-control behaviors as absolutely the linchpin of adaptive human functioning. 
Melissa Murphy has volunteered for a test of her self-control. She's to push a button when seeing a circle or a square on the screen. But she's not to press the button if she hears a beep. Since she's poised to respond to the circle or square, she has to arrest that impulse when the beep sounds. It's trickier than you might think. And Melissa is bringing something unique to the task. A brain wired with electrodes that are flooding her ventral striatum with dopamine. The electrodes, eight of them, were implanted deep in her brain several years ago as a last-ditch attempt to treat debilitating depression. I became sick in August 2004 with an episode of depression that depression doesn't really seem like the right word for it. It was all-encompassing. And after two years of numerous drug trials, several, about 29 sessions of ECT, they were running a, a trial here at Mass General, and I enrolled, and I was the first patient to become part of the DPS trial. But it was an existence that was, it, it was awful. I was a very successful public relations director beforehand. I walked out of my office and just sort of left life behind. So you were the first subject in this in this new uh, procedure. That's right. And how how is it explained to you that what 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 the procedure would do? To be honest, at the time I didn't care. Mm. Um, my greatest hope was that they would do the surgery and I would expire on the table. I mm. had lost all hope at that point. But within a few months, we started to see a difference, and it was it was amazing. The implants are working in Melissa's brain because they're getting more dopamine into this ventral striatal area, which is giving her the chance to move, to get going, because the depression was resulting, was, was, was a way of not to get moving. It was, she was stopped by the depression. Now right. she's not, not depressed because the, the uh, implants are supplying that dopamine, right, through stimulation. Right, when Melissa was depressed, she didn't have the motivation to get up and, and complete her activities right. of daily living. Right, literally not able to get up. That's exactly yeah. right. Melissa has bravely volunteered for what at the time we filmed with her was an unprecedented experiment. She's agreed to have her deep brain stimulation that for some six years now she's relied on to keep her functioning deliberately turned off. As she sits quietly for about 30 minutes, the dopamine that's been counteracting her depression is draining from her brain. How are you feeling now? A little blurry, um, a little more sort of subdued. Mm -hmm. A little bit, slightly, very mild. You know, I, 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 th I think I see a little blurriness in your eyes, a little lack of focus. It's like a fog, yeah. like a mild fog, yeah. Does it worry you? Are you feeling any anxiety about this? No, because I know it's going to be turned back on, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah. If, I, if I didn't have that end goal, I, I would be worried. So now there's less dopamine getting to this go area, to this get up and go area. And therefore, the areas that are enabled, enabling her to stop in the midst of an urge have more to say about things. They're more, they're more um, effective because there's less get up and go, there's more stopping a, a, available. That's right. We think we're shifting the balance of behavior in favor of the stop process because the go is sort of down right away. So when she hears the beep and that says to her, I got to stop, she's able to overcome the urge to keep going because that urge is lessened with less dopamine in that area of the brain. That's exactly what we think. I got it. Okay, that's good. Well, then, so now you should do great on the test. Oh, yeah. You got it. I don't know if I got it. <laughs> Look, it's very simple. <laughs> Break it down for me. Melissa is the first subject to volunteer for what is by any measure an ambitious test of the idea that dopamine's flooding of the ventral striatum contributes to impulsivity and that withholding dopamine makes controlling an impulse easier. So this one experiment won't settle the question. Nonetheless, I saw a lot of cases this time because I was watching your fingers mm. um, the whole time, and I saw a lot of instances where there was a, a flinch where you yes, were about to press it, right. you almost pressed it, and you pulled yourself back at the last Yeah, and there were several of instances of that. Yeah. And I can't remember back to the first set we did, but... Um, there seemed to be fewer times. Maybe, maybe. I wasn't watching as closely. I yeah. Know. But is that an example of timing? In other words, she's, she's able to 
But you, you don't really record that. You don't record that little flinch. We wouldn't record the flinch, no, but we can infer across all of the trials in general you know, how quickly she's able to withhold her responding and, and how quick the responses that she makes are compared to when right. she's off stimulation. An hour after the stimulation was turned off, Melissa's ventral striatum again starts getting the dopamine it needs to keep her brain in balance. Thank nice you so you. much. Oh, no, good luck with everything. So and thank you. Nice hey, to meet you. Thank you so much for oh, your time Oh, anytime, anytime.